you his Hello? Twitter. Hey there. Hey there. Good morning. Well, afternoon for you. Hello. Hello. Yes. How are yes, you doing? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm great. I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> It looks like a little bit of a beard, a beard trim since we last saw you. Maybe you're looking a little, uh, little trimmed up there. That's a good sign. Uh, the barber shops are open and key. No, that's Vietnamese guys in DC. You know, <laughs> <laughs> everything is still closed and keep in these cigars. That's why. <laughs> All right. So, so for the last two shows, one you were racing on a plane and you talked to us from an airport terminal. Uh, on your way to DC. Last week you were in a meeting. I'm not even sure I'm allowed to say where you were, but can you tell us anything about those two meetings? Is there anything you can tell us about where you were and what was going on? That was in relation to sanctions. Uh, okay. Yes, the, uh, the first uh, the first one was in DC, and uh, the second one was in London. And yeah, unfortunately, that was the the type of meeting when you can never guess when that would happen and you cannot yes. say you know uh, i have i have another appointment please please move it half an hour later that's unfortunately was not the case yeah uh, but well uh, we can understand uh, that very, Are... i'm very much i'm very much sorry for this yes, yes. <laughs> is there anything you can tell us about the outcome of these meetings even if you know it was positive or it was neutral or it was negative is there any details you can give us no, it, uh, they all were very positive, and uh, I cannot give you all the details at the moment, you know, that, that would soon be public, but uh, in general, we were talking about the uh, sanctions, sanctions policy. I am advocating a lot that uh, sanctions should not be a, a mere punishment, that it should be a policy tool, and because uh, punishment is something that you usually uh, uh, apply via court decision. Uh, and sanctions is something that uh, one government is telling to an individual, look, that we don't like what you guys are doing. Uh, that's why uh, we don't want you on our territory or have business in, 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 in my country and whatever. But if you do this and that, uh, uh, you can continue. Uh, and right now, all the sanctions, they're structured like a punishment. Yeah, but uh, there is no encouragement of what they, of what this individual should actually do, and this is something that I really want to change, and that's why I'm shuttling between different European and American capitals mm -hmm. uh, uh, to get uh, on the common grounds in these regards, and so that would be implemented, and that would be uh, um, some prime case uh, examples that we actually achieved our objectives. I've been following you on Twitter and you just, um, oh shoot, what did I do? Where did it go? You just put something on Twitter about a linguist. I, I clicked away, so I don't have it in front of me. But you talked about a linguist on Twitter in your last post before you joined us. And she's talking about what should Russia be like? You know, what's the future? Which is very much what you just said. Do you want to talk about that linguist tweet and why you think it's so important for us to be talking about the future instead of just where things are with Ukraine today? No, it is uh, very important. Um, this is a continuation. We were having on our TV channel Ultra Fevrela uh, yesterday, uh, we had uh, our leading uh, sociologist. Uh, his name is Lev Gutkov. He is the chairman of Levada Center, which is the leading uh, uh, Russian uh, sociological outlet. And uh, he was saying that we have these uh, protest groups in Russia, uh, which are actually ready to rebel. Right? They actually to move forward, but they currently do not see their political representation. And uh, it's pretty hard for them to get associated with the exiled liberals uh, for a certain reason. Most importantly, that those liberals are too much associated with 1990s and with the chaos of those years. People don't want to go back in those 90s. Um, from another side, uh, the, 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 the two major nucleuses of, uh, of people. One is, uh, is more liberal uh, urban uh, population and another is pretty distressed and frustrated uh, population of small rural areas and uh, those who lost their jobs recently and uh, you know who, are, who really suffer of, uh, because of everything that's going on and actually that's uh, uh, the, uh, the, that's, that's the group of people who is the main 
donors of victims for this war because uh, that's where uh, Putin is recruiting his army from. And um, these people, they want to see more somebody pretty associated with uh, some social programs, uh, with the protective measures. Uh, so it could politically it could be either left or right, but socially it should be somebody who is on more or less on the left side. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, uh, and there is no such proposition. And uh, we were discussing uh, um, uh, what the politician should should approach those people with. Uh, and uh, Gutkov was talking a lot about this uh, vision for future. Uh, and I totally agree with him. I, so that's my common message that I am I'm trying to bring more and more examples from different sides of political spectrum, people about uh, who, who talk in, in, in the way that I have a dream, uh, who has a dream, and uh, that this dream is appealing to the population. But recently, um, uh, yesterday, our, our, our conclusion with Lev Gutkov was even simpler than that. The, the, first, the first conclusion, uh, the, uh, the first condition uh, uh, for such a politician should be this, this politician should really love Russian people, uh, no matter what they do. Um, it's like parents love their kids, you know, mm -hmm. those kids uh, can sometimes commit crimes, but you should nevertheless love them. Uh, otherwise, uh, they would never follow you, they would never listen to you, because you, it should be clear that you want to do good for them. Uh, and uh, right now, a lot of uh, uh, Russian uh, opposition Folks, they are talking in the way that, oh, you know, that's that's so awful. Russian people are awful. Uh, uh, you know, we don't know what to do with the country. It has to be uh, broken apart. Uh, they have to be punished. Uh, you know, um, that Ukrainians should kill as many Russians as possible. Uh, and obviously, that does not create, generate a lot of public appeal with those who are still in Russia. Yeah. So just to be clear, when you talk about opposition people, you're talking about opposition outside of Russia, and it's not empowering people who might oppose the war inside of Russia, among other things, correct? Yeah, mostly they are already outside Russia, but there are still some people inside Russia, but still they're talking in the same, uh, in the same fashion. And uh, then that's, that's really bad. You know, it's, uh, that, uh, that is not... Uh, uh, getting the uh, the message across to uh, ordinary uh, Russians, and uh, that makes them pretty feel them pretty abandoned, uh, yeah. and make them deaf uh, to any of the absolutely right uh, phrases that uh, the opposition may have to say. Is it fair to say that Russians inside of Russia are not feeling that love from their own country or their own government as well? I mean, my sense is if you're Russian, you probably, you have this sort of ideological sense of love for Russia, but I've never really had the sense that Russians ever felt particularly loved as individuals as Russians inside of Russia. I uh, totally agree with you. They uh, feel like they're orf orphans. And mm. I think that all the crimes that we actually uh, see in Bucha and Ukraine and in other locations in, in, in Ukraine. That's actually the very origin of where it's coming from. Yes, mm. When the person is not loved, or when the person is felt abandoned, uh, when the person may feel itself being on its own, when the person feels oppression, um, and uh, sometimes uh, it feels even violence against himself uh, on behalf of the uh, governments and, uh, uh, and the community. Uh, that results in the violence that he produces in return. And it's interesting because comparing what you just described amongst Russians feeling like orphans and contrasting that with what I think we see amongst Ukrainians, it seems to be a country that not only broke away from Russia economically and democratically and politically, but it seems like they have a culture that embraces one and all with love, as you're describing, and, and and you live in Kiev. Is that what you see? Yeah, actually, you're very much uh, on target here. Um, uh, that's one of the things that uh, when I'm being asked by uh, uh, Ukrainian journalists and just by Ukrainian people, what do you feel is different in Ukraine uh, from what you saw in Russia? 
And usually the first thing that uh, I say is about the role of the family. Mm. Uh, in Ukraine, it's valued way, 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 way much higher than in Russia. Mm. Uh, in uh, Russian, even there is such a phrase that is believed to be said by our famous writer, Anton Chekhov, um, <laughs> that when um, uh, your wife cheats on you, you should be happy that it does not cheat on the mother one. Say it again. Uh, you should be happy she does not cheat on... On the motherland. On the motherland. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we see the priority there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, uh, that's that is something that is uh, <laughs> that does not fit Ukrainian mindset. That's yeah. actually that has uh, that has a lot of uh, negative consequences as well because the uh, feeling of uh, statehood uh, in uh, Ukraine is very low because of this. And uh, actually, one of the sources of uh, famous, still famous uh, Ukrainian corruption is also in. In, in this particular area, mm. you, know, you, mm. you value your family above the interest of the state. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, uh, it's way healthier what, uh, what we see in Ukraine in this regards to what we see in Russia. Yeah. So one of the things I want to ask you about today, it, it, there's been a lot of talk. I, I'm thinking about the New York Times. I'm thinking about Henry Kissinger. I'm thinking about some uh -huh. world leaders about this idea of appeasement. I want to explain for a minute what the word means. The, basically, there, there, is a, 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 there are some voices out there who are saying Ukraine should end the war by giving some land to Putin. This is the idea of appeasement. You appease the aggressor. Ukraine, of course, and, and many, 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 many more around the world are saying, you know, that's BS. That's the Ukrainians in particular are saying, well, that is not happening. And they have many, many supporters around the world in that idea. But it seems to me, given what you've said here today and how you've described Russia and how a better Russia could be, the idea of appeasement is, in, is directly contradictory to the vision you're proposing because it tells Mr. Putin and other world leaders it's okay to invade another country because you actually get rewarded in the end. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Hundred percent. I uh, want to say uh, to people who propose this, you know, sorry for my French, but go fuck yourself. <laughs> Your French is appropriate here. So, is there a is it a surprise that this conversation about appeasement has come up, or or within the Ukrainian ranks has it been expected all along that at some point there would be voices advocating for this? Well, you know, I think that there are several origin um, uh, why is uh, all this happening and why such voices are heard. Uh, from one side, um, um, the former network of influencers uh, of Russia in the Western world um, has gone nowhere. It still exists. You know, they were yes. silent because uh, they were under duress, they, they were shocked by the invasion, but uh, those people, they still exist. And uh, it's very sad to say that uh, Secretary Kissinger is one of them. Uh, is one of uh, people who are called uh, one, one of uh, like, uh, foreign policy experts um, made a very accurate description of those people as Putin first -tayers. Uh, those who understand Putin, uh, yes. understand in, in, in brackets. Um, and uh, um, unfortunately, they do spread this idea that, you know, you should pacify the aggressor, you should pacify the uh, dictator, um, you know, there has to be a certain uh, synthetic interest above uh, uh, not only uh, the common sense, but uh, on the common morale. Um, uh, somebody killed somebody, but it's okay because he was more, more mighty, and you know we should we should tolerate that. You know that's totally not my approach to life, yes. and uh, ne ne neither of uh, the overwhelming majority of uh, Ukrainians. At the end of the day, that is something for Ukrainians to decide whether they want to continue fighting or whether they want to stop where they are and then make an agreement with Putin. But I right now uh, see zero interest in Ukraine 
uh, to concede uh, any of Ukrainian territories uh, to Putin. Right now, I see an overwhelming majority uh, that desires uh, uh, to win the war. And I think that's, you know, that's uh, a very understandable and the most realistic and pragmatic approach uh, under these present circumstances. There is a second group of people uh, uh, in in United States, which are, which are not uh, like Russian agents, which are not Putin first years, but uh, those who are thinking about the uh, upcoming elections. And uh, and there is a great phrase that was uh, sent. Uh, so it was said once, I believe, by uh, Winston Churchill, but I'm, I may be mistaken here, you know, on, of the origin uh, of uh, the quote, but the phrase is that uh, a politician is thinking about the uh, upcoming elections and the statesperson is uh, uh, thinking about his country. And um, I think that uh, uh, those voices in New York Times, they are thinking about the elections. Uh, there's so much a phrase that uh, this uh, narrow majority uh, that uh, Democrats have uh, currently in the Senate would disappear and uh, that uh, the Congress also could be lost uh, to Republicans. And they are not thinking about the mistakes that they have made in uh, their uh, economic policies in general, but they want to like, put the blame on what's going on in, in Europe and saying, you know, like we should uh, stay away because that hurts our economy, that it's not we are who are at fault, but it's them who are at fault. And mm -hmm. uh, they, they hope that by doing this, they can get more votes in, in November. But I think it's a very short-sighted approach. One of the questions I have for you, <clears throat> it seems to me that just this talk of appeasement, it's just, it's talk and it's not coming from Ukraine. Because, as you've said, you know, the majority of Ukrainians and the Ukrainian leadership completely 100% opposes this. That's my impression, and you've confirmed it. But it seems to me that anyone with some power of their voice, the New York Times, Henry Kissinger, any talk of appeasement from them can only be or will be used by Russians, by Mr. Putin, at least in Russia, as an affirmation for the war. So just the talk of it is damaging, even though the conversation or the talk is not coming from the Ukrainians themselves. Well, uh, look, uh, thanks God, we have freedom of speech here. Um, uh, and, you know, whoever wants to say something, uh, he can do this, you know, mm -hmm. it's not an official source. And with yeah. the New York Times, you know, even less Henry Kissinger, uh, are the uh, authentic voices of uh, U.S. administration or any other country's administrations. So, uh, you know, if they want to express their opinion, let them do it. Uh, I think that they hurt their own reputation more than mm. they actually uh, hurt our, our common cause. Um, the important thing is that uh, to make sure that uh, those who are actually making the decisions would not uh, see this as uh, some common voice that uh, it's not the voice of the majority it's the voice yeah. of certain individuals you know who express their own opinions let them do this yeah so what are you hearing from your contacts in russia about the war today is there i get a sense from looking at twitter reading news and things like that including the new york times that there may be a shift in the thinking of the Russian people about the war. There may be some kind of growing tide in opposition of it and, 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 a, and a bit of courage in speaking out. Is, is that an accurate perception here in the West? Are you hearing those same things? Um, frankly speaking, I don't hear uh, like a public voice. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I cannot say that uh, uh, the pro-war uh, group is uh, somehow splitting apart and dissipating. But in general, a certain uh, detergence of it uh, is happening. And uh, uh, again, when we were talking to sociologists uh, recently, uh, they are confirming this. And I think that the uh, next major sociological survey that is uh, coming at the end of this month uh, would show a further decline in the popular support for the war, uh, but it's still a significant uh, portion of the population that do support the war. 
Uh, actually, I, I think that the most important thing at this very moment is uh, the growing split within the elite. Uh, uh, and this is not something that you would see in tweets or something, but this is something that you hear through gossip uh, and through the private uh, talks. Again, mm -hmm. like after I made the tour in London Grad and, you know, in, in other European places, no, that's what I have heard many times uh, from different Russians. Uh, that some of them, some of them, they uh, they think that they're somehow cornered with the sanctions and they don't know what to do. Like being in the West, they don't know what to do, and they're looking for an escape. Uh, but I also hear from people back home that are kind of passing a message. That you know, we here we are ready to discuss with the West the conditions, uh, you know, for uh, our. I wouldn't say I wouldn't use the word defection, but uh, that's that's probably the most the most accurate one. Is your assessment still that this war has to end with the end of Mr. Putin and his life? Definitely yes. It's no, nothing has changed, and nothing can be changed in this. In, in, in this regards, and this is something that uh, Mr. Kissinger, uh, where, where he is counterproductive in, in, in whatever he is saying. But at the same time, you know, maybe I'm wrong here that he is counterproductive. Maybe he is productive because uh, yeah, that's what many people are asking me and were asking actually during all my visits uh, is whether Vladimir Putin feels himself cornered because mm. he can become dangerous when he's cornered. So when he, when he hears such voices uh, as the voice uh, of Mr. Kissinger, uh, it helps uh, to send him a message that he is not yet in the corner. And by not being in the corner, he would never use the nukes or, or, or whatever, because he still uh, may have certain illusions that mm. uh, he can escape. Of course, he is trapped already. And he's that that guy already. But uh, if he feels that he is not, that's a positive thing. So you're describing three-dimensional chess here, in a way, right? I mean, then we have to ask: Is Mr. Kissinger saying what he's saying? Not that he believes <laughs> it, but because he wants Putin to not feel cornered, because that would make Putin more dangerous. And part of what you're saying here, if I understand correctly, is it's good that Mr. Putin does not feel cornered because when he's cornered, he's going to do even more crazy things than he's already done. That, that's part of what you're saying here. Well, if he is cornered, uh, for every person who is cornered, he may do different crazy things. But yes. it's a different. Uh, uh, the question is when this uh, realization uh, starts to get to you, know, you know, look at the example of uh, Mr. Hitler. Yes. Uh, you know, just a couple of days be before his suicide, he was still talking about some Wunderwaffe, you know, that he he still can win the war, you know, and nobody <laughs> already believed that he can win the war, but yes. he's still right. like bragging <laughs> that, that, that we can. And that's an ideal case scenario for Vladimir Putin, you know. Let yes. him feel the same way, but just let all people around him to understand that he's wrong. Yeah. Um, Let us says, looking forward to see who Putin is going to marry last minute. Okay, well, that's a whole other. <laughs> But actually, <laughs> let, let, I'm glad let, you put let, the... Let's make bets. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that would, be, that would be his escape. That would be his escape strategy. He would marry uh, the hockey player Avechkin so that all the gay community would consolidate around him. And oh my God. Mr. Putin would be seen as a discrimination. <laughs> I, I, that's 4D chess. We just talked about three-dimensional chess. You're going into four-dimensional chess. So I actually want to close with some questions that came the last time you were with us because we didn't get to, to ask them the last time you were here. So Maggie Fit in the last show where you were here asked, We're hearing rumors about Putin being sick. I've heard these kind of ongoingly. Do you know anything? Do you think there's any truth to it? Do you know anything about it? No, I think uh, that him being sick is a real information that he is mm -hmm. sick, and there are a lot of indications that he is sick. But uh, does it matter? I am not so sure. 
Yes, mm -hmm. uh, we know that with the modern medicine, with the modern healthcare, you can uh, be sick for a very long time, you yeah. know, and still stay stay alive. Uh, and for many people, I would say thanks God. Uh, for, for Vladimir Putin, I would say alas, but yeah. uh, that's uh, that's the uh, that's the reality. And uh, so we shouldn't uh, make our bets uh, on uh, on him being sick that he would be gone, and like we shouldn't do nothing. No, we should fight. Yeah. You know, and if uh, by some miracle uh, the gods would decide earlier than us, you know, perfect. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you for that. All right, so uh, Lily has just asked, do you consider, I'm not going to say his name right, is it Medet, 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 Medvedev? Medvedev. Medvedev. Yeah. Do you consider him any better? And Violetta and Watcher on the last show asked the same question. Actually, it was Watcher. What are the odds that Putin's successor will be just like him or worse? I mean, that, that has to be a concern here, right? Yeah, it should be a concern for sure. And that's why I think that this process should not be uh, left um, abandoned, you know, that, uh, that that would happen by itself. We, uh, uh, everybody who is concerned should be a part of this process. Yes. Um, I think that uh, this uh, tree is already cut but it didn't yet fall and uh, we need to make sure that it's falling in the right direction that it does not kill anyone you know when it would be when it would be falling um and uh, yes there are people which are worse and there are people people which are worse even within the opposition yes. um and uh, there are people who are progressive there are people who are like putin there are people who are worse than putin Yes. Um, uh, even within the liberal part of the opposition, you know, some people I think uh, are um, a good replacement, but some people I don't think are a good replacement. Um, and there is not just a liberal opposition, there are other um, uh, regiments uh, of, of anti-Putin uh, folks. Uh, but uh, if we're speaking about uh, like the palace coup and uh, those who are at, at the high command, uh, I think that actual competition on uh, uh, being a Putin, uh, Putin being Putin's successor would be between two people. It can be uh, Medvedev or it can be Kiryenko, the current uh, first deputy chief of presidential staff. And I think that the better odds right now are with Kiryenko. Uh, because he is the center of the interest of uh, uh, currently the most uh, influential uh, group of uh, Putin's cronies, which is led by Yuri Kovalchuk. Um, so I would pay more attention uh, towards uh, Kirienka. But the question is that uh, whoever would be nominated uh, uh, by uh, this Putin gang, uh, I don't think uh, that it would be a sustainable solution. Because I think that by the moment they would actually get enough courage uh, to replace uh, Putin with such a person, it would be too late. Hmm. And uh, that uh, he would just uh, not be able to consolidate power and, uh, and prevent uh, popular, popular uprising. And who would be the leader of the popular ri uh, 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 rising? We will see. Well, and this really, this is actually a great way for us to wrap this up because how we started talking about this is conversations going on now about a better future for Russia, right? And it seems to me that as those conversations are happening, as you're having those conversations and others are having the conversations, even publicly, no. a better plan yeah. for a better Russia can arise so that when there is no more Putin, there is somebody or a party or a team or a, a leadership group ready to step into that role and take Russia into the future instead of keeping it stuck in the past. I, I, I fully agree, but Greg, uh, let me answer really uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, there is a doubt that there would be a coup in, in Russia. And I would say mm -hmm. that right now I also have a lot of doubts on this uh, I, uh, because uh, something like this is being driven by fear. It does not, it, the coup is, is driven not by a positive dream. Mm -hmm. uh, coup is, uh, coup would be driven by fears that if not the coup, you know, something like real catastrophic would uh, actually happen. And 
that can be a, like military defeat or um, uh, it can be uh, the confrontation with the West, uh, you know, a nuclear war, uh, but most uh, uh, possible um, that it would be fear of the popular uprising. Yes. I think that is, that is the precondition uh, for the coup. And as soon as we will have uh, enough signs that uh, the wind is blowing in that direction and some wind is starting um, uh, going there, then we can have this discussion in a greater detail. Yeah. All right. Well, and, and I hope we will. And soon. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Is there anything you want to add before I let you go today? I am. Um... I'm happy that I am back to Kiev and can talk to you guys normally, <laughs> not on not on the run. I yes. hope that next ne next week we'll uh, meet again and uh, let's keep up the good uh, work. Uh, you know, we uh, very uh, uh, thankful for everybody who keeps uh, donating to us and who helps us. Uh, that's that's all very visible and that's uh, very important. And, I, and w with that, you're bringing that up. I want to just, I want to talk again for a moment about the Bravery Foundation, your Bravery Foundation. Uh, Lucy, Ina, they just uh, made donations. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, and I'm going to put a link here. Um, for anyone that wants to donate, you can just hit the button at the top of your screen with a dollar sign or it says pay host on it. Everybody here has heard me say it before, but even though it says pay host and the hosts are Ilya and I, we're not being paid to, to be here. We're volunteers. Every dollar that you donate is going to the Bravery Foundation. And I just put a link to it as well that you can share with your friends and family. Do you want to just take a moment again to tell us what the Bravery Foundation is doing and why it's so important that we support it? Um, yeah, definitely. The Bravery Foundation that we have established is the uh, foundation that helps uh, those Russians who decided to stop fighting, uh, who stopped being a part of this war machine. This is for soldiers who decided to defect. This is for government workers who decided to resign. These are for propaganda people that uh, decided to publicly stand against uh, this regime. They all, after they make their moves, they are facing persecution, they are facing oppression, they are facing a lot of life uh, problems. And some of them we need to rescue uh, by smuggling them out of the country. Some of them are getting arrested. We need to pay uh, for the lawyers. Uh, some of them just needs to be uh, helped to uh, uh, settle down and find a new job. And uh, that's yeah. what we are doing. And, and the beauty of this is you're identifying people who are opposing the war inside of Russia. And actually by supporting these people, you're disrupting pieces of the war effort, soldiers, Absolutely. members of the propaganda machine, et cetera. Yeah, and we are showing that there are different Russians. Yeah, that's a beautiful thing. All right, Ilya, thanks for being here today. I'm going to put the link to the Bravery Foundation in the chat again. Uh, please share that with your friends and family. If you can hit the button above with the dollar sign or that says pay host uh, and make a donation here, every dollar helps. And when you hit that button, it's you can give a $2, you can give a $1,000. Any amount will help. And believe me, and I think Ilya will back me up on this, Two U.S. dollars, you know, less than a cup of Starbucks, goes a lot longer in Russia and Ukraine. It goes a lot further than it does here. So if you look at that and you say, all I can do is $2, please do the $2 because it will make a huge difference. So thank Thanks you, William, for being here. And uh, we'll see you next week. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, thanks for being here. And see you next week. Thank you very much. See you next week. You bet.